Listen, today's story is a difficult one. Last week, the singer Cassie sued Diddy. Those allegations included years of abuse. Diddy ended up denying those allegations. Then they reached a settlement. And there's still a lot to get into here. So today on the podcast, we're going to talk about the way that power operates in music. I'm Elamin Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Listen, before we get into any of this, I just want to remind people of just like how large a cultural force Cassie was when she arrived. This is the song that did that for her. time gem to be honest with you that's a bit of cassie's debut single me and you it went platinum it helped make cassie one of the new it girls of that era the reason we're talking about cassie today is because this past thursday news broke that she filed a lawsuit against her former boyfriend sean diddy combs that lawsuit was the first lawsuit that i've ever seen that had a trigger warning on the front of it it accused the rapper and the music mogul of rape of trafficking, of years of abuse, among other extremely troubling allegations. Sean Combs denied all of those allegations. And then a day later, on Friday, news broke that Cassie and Diddy reached a settlement, although the details of that settlement have not been disclosed. Given the accusations, I want to warn you that some of them are going to be a little bit difficult to hear. But also, we're going to get into this story broadly. Kathleen Newman-Remang is here. David Dennis Jr. is here. We're going to talk through all of this. Kathleen, David, welcome to the show. Uh, thank Hi, you for having us. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Of course. Listen, Kathleen, let me start with you. What was your initial reaction when the news of the lawsuit broke? Whew. I mean, I felt for Cassie. You know, I read the yeah. entire legal document. As you mentioned, it includes a trigger warning, which is rare in cases like this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it has that warning that there's going to be highly graphic information of sexual nature, including sexual assault. And so I think because of that, I thought I was prepared for how bad it was going to be. Sure. And it was worse than I could have imagined. And at this point, when allegations like this come out against powerful men in Hollywood or in the music industry, not to take away from the impact or the severity, but it's sad to say that I'm not surprised anymore. Mm. I think we should all still be shocked and appalled that this keeps happening. But we know that men in these positions of power abuse that power and mm. that their fame and their money shield them from facing consequences for their actions, especially when those actions are perpetrated against black women. Mm-hmm. And in this case, you know, there have been rumors surrounding Diddy's character or lack thereof for years. Mm. And so, you know, I choose to believe every word Cassie alleges here. And as she said in her statement, she wanted to speak up on behalf of herself and other women who face violence and abuse. And so my overwhelming reaction was just feeling that what Cassie did is incredibly brave and that she's going to help other survivors, hopefully. And Mm -hmm. I hope she's safe and surrounded by love and that she's able to heal. I, uh, the... But one of the most harrowing things um, that I think uh, in that particular lawsuit was Cassie sort of talking about how casually uh, the cruelty came from from Sean Diddy Combs. Again, I want to say this lawsuit was settled the next day. Um, also, the timing of the lawsuit is, is, is worth mentioning because there was a statute of limitations that was extended because of the Me Too movement um, for you to bring cases that had you know, long since expired. Um, she was allowed to bring this lawsuit forth. That, that, that sort of extension was about to expire at the end of this year, which kind of explains a little bit of the timing. David, what about you? When the initial news broke, what was your reaction? Yeah, like much like Kathleen, I mean, you, you see the headlines and there's accusations and you kind of go into it thinking you sort of know what that's going to mean. And mm-hmm. then as you kept reading after every paragraph, it seemed to get worse and worse and it seemed to get more repulsive and it seemed to get more um, terrifying. The, the, you know, the further you read down and the more that you feel this woman and what she went through and, you know, what, you know, that meant for her. And then on, on the macro level. I just kept thinking about the fact that, you know, most of this year has I've been spending celebrating hip hop and 50 years of hip hop and thinking about largely all these men that we've been celebrating. And the fact that, you know, statistically, you know, as is normally the case, when you celebrate a lot of these men, there are, you know, innumerable women who have to, you know, witness celebrating men who have 
abuse them. Right. Yeah. And so we are rolling out the red carpet for these men who, you know, this status and this, this, you know, celebrity that they have and this legendary stuff that we talk about only further traumatize these women and also creates another shield around these men. And so Diddy um, is, is, you know, another one of those people who we have celebrated all year, who has spent the year talking about love and all mm-hmm. this stuff. And we've, you know, given cash, writing checks to HBCUs and, you know, all the stuff that he represents. Meanwhile, allegedly there's um, at least one person who is watching this and, you know, reliving the most, you know, terrible moments of her life. Mm-hmm. I, Kathleen, I see you shaking your head, like agreeing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about Diddy on this show because he was awarded, you know, in conjunction with Hip Hop 50. And there have been allegations against him in the past that kind of just got swept under the rug. And it is, yeah, everything David said, I was nodding just because I I very much agree. And I think that, you know, we are all complicit Mm. in this system that upholds and protects these abusers. and, And I really would love for that to stop. Uh, David, the details of Cassie's lawsuit and the allegations genuinely are extremely unsettling. I'm thinking of the Kid Cudi example, um, which Mm. is one of the things that the lawsuit alleges is that, you know, um, Cassie uh, said that uh, Diddy had mentioned blowing up Kid Cudi's vehicle and then Kid Cudi's car exploded. And she's not necessarily making the link, but she's saying like these two events, in fact, did happen. Mm. What were some of the things that stood out for you in her in the lawsuit? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go too much into detail because, you know, it's, um, it's you know, triggering for a lot of people to, yeah. to you know, see what happened. But I mean, obviously, there was physical abuse. There was um, allegations of trafficking, of um, yes. coercion. Um, obviously, the, the violence, the just sheer, you know, violence that he allegedly inflicted, the Kid Cudi situation. Um, I mean, it, it's just a... Um, like endless array of terror like that's what Mm -hmm. that's the the word i keep going back going back to like to live you know to allegedly you know live through um this tremendous terror for all the years that that she did i mean that's the thing that that um that sticks with me but there's just uh, you know just extreme violence just things that i don't know how you you know recover from and Mm. you know yeah that that, that's really what what stood out to me when i was when i was reading it kathleen what about you yeah, I'm also hesitant to go into um, any of the specific details, but because they are very graphic. But as David mentioned, some of them, you know, there's the manipulation and the controlling her, plying her with drugs, you know, forcing her into sexual acts with male sex workers while he watched and filmed that abuse. Other things that, you know, I don't really want to repeat, but the thing that always stands out to me in these cases is that it doesn't take just one person to dole out abuse like this over many years. You know, there were multiple accounts in this lawsuit where Cassie describes that people would lie for Diddy and cover up his beatings of her. And so, you know, in in cases like this, there are systems in place and a machine that that surrounds these these powerful people. And, you know, you brought up the Kid Cudi story. And so for me, the, the thing about the Cuddy story that, you know, it's interesting with all of the abuse that's detailed that this is the story that that seems to be people are latching onto. And I think because honestly, it is hard for people to believe black women for many reasons, as we know. And so if you're going to believe Kid Cuddy and his team who say that this is all true, that his car exploded in his driveway shortly after Diddy threatened to blow up Kid Cuddy's car, Imagine the power that you have to have to blow up another very successful, powerful man and famous in his own rights car to act out this revenge fantasy without that getting into the press Mm -hmm. and without that becoming a major story. I just to me, if you believe that this that story tells us that Diddy is capable of violent, vicious, callous acts. Mm -hmm. And it tells us what kind of a man he is. Uh, Kathleen, this story broke on Thursday. And then the next day we learned that Cassie and Diddy have reached a settlement. We don't know the details of that settlement. That settlement has not been made public. But you see sort of online people who are are happy for Cassie. You see people who are writing for Diddy, and I don't really know why they'd want to do that. And then you also see people questioning this idea of of, of Cassie's decision to settle. How How are you thinking about this settlement? How are you thinking about Cassie decision to settle this the next day? Well, as you mentioned, she filed under the New York Adult Survivors Act, right? And that's about to expire. Um, So I think it's important to note that timing and why she filed now. Um, And I think it was settled so quickly to me 
It says that Cassie wanted this on record, but she also didn't want a spectacle. I'm sure this is very traumatic for her, um, triggering for her. And so even though Diddy's team denies this, it's clear to me that he was spooked and didn't want to go through the discovery and the details that would come out in court. And he wanted to wrap this up as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, Because again, I believe Cassie. And so to me, the settlement and how quickly it happened that is an indictment on Diddy, not on Cassie wanting, we don't know the details of it, but wanting money or whatever that is. Um, to me, I think it's clear the timing is because of that act. And the the wrapping it up timing is is because Diddy has stuff to hide. Mm-hmm. Uh, we should say, David, um, it hasn't gone unnoticed. This is the thing that you mentioned, right? This idea that like three of the biggest music moguls in rap and R&B history are facing or have faced allegations of sexual sexual assault allegations fairly recently. There's Def Jam Records co-founder Russell Simmons. There is L.A. Reid, the co-founder of L.A. Face Records. And now Bad Boy Records founder Sean Diddy Combs. All three have denied these allegations. You know, I remember last year um, Dr. Dre was headlining the Super Bowl and um, some of the previous allegations against him sort of came forward, you know, back up to the surface again. What goes through your mind when you consider all of this through line and these names and what we associate with them, but also these stories? Yeah, I mean, it's just a reminder that this entire history of hip hop, uh, you can't really talk about it without talking about the way that uh, we treated the women along the way. And that includes the um, violence and the silencing and the, you know, horror that we've, um, you know, perpetrated with these women, whether we talk about the way that we, um, the music is made, but also just the literal, just, you know, discarding of, of so many women who, you know, have built the backbone, the foundation of, of um, the, the genre. Like we're mm-hmm. talking, we talk about the people who are making these accusations, who um, are getting the headlines, these hack- accusations, we're talking about the Cassies and the Drew Dixons, these people who have monumental contributions to the to to hip hop right yeah. and have done so in spite of the fact that along the way these men have done their best to you know tamp out those fires and like you cannot have these Dr. Dre's and L.A. Reed's and all these people and and not tell that part of the story. Right. Mm. Um, of course, they're you know, everything is, um, you know, they're disputing all this and, and all that. But that is the story. Right. Mm. Like that is as important. I don't care how much music you made. I don't care how um, many artists you signed. I don't care what your you know, what your hits are. Your story is about the women that you've harmed along the way. And that is that is more important than anything you could ever contribute. Kathleen. Last yeah. And so. Well, I was just going to say to that point, Cassie was signed to Bad Boy Records. Mm -hmm. Diddy was her boss. And so you cannot separate it because he was able to use his position in the music industry to wield this power and keep her in a position where she could not leave because personally and professionally she was trapped in this. And so, you know, I think that sometimes when you look at a story like this, you see two rich celebrities and think it has nothing to do with me or with real life. Mm. But there are many women going through what Cassie says she lived through without her money and without her fame. And if she is dealing with this kind of scrutiny for coming forward, you can see why so many women don't. 70% of domestic violence is never reported. And we know that in many of these cases, it ends tragically for women. We know the justice system isn't typically on their side, especially for Black women. So I just want to leave us with remembering that it is incredibly courageous for women to come forward and that what's important here is protecting survivors, dismantling systems that protect abusers, and believing Black women. Kathleen, David, I think that is a perfect place to leave it. I appreciate your time. I also think like if people have the energy for it, I think they should go and read that lawsuit because yeah. um, I, I appreciate both of you being careful to sort of, you know, um, not give the details on air. But if you have the capacity to engage with the details of that lawsuit, it is worth your time to look the horrors in the face. But in the meantime, Kathleen, David, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Yeah. Of course. Kathleen Newman Bermang is a deputy director at Refinery29 Unbothered. David Dennis Jr. is a veteran music journalist and culture critic. For more on this story, you can always go to CBC News. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Elamine Abdul Mahmoud, and you are listening to Commotion. Okay, we're going to shift gears, and we're shifting gears to one of the most talked about movies in Hollywood right now. It is a reboot of a popular cartoon franchise. It stars big names like Will Forte and John Cena, and also... The reason that everyone's talking about it is that no one can actually see it. Coyote vs. Acme was supposed to bring your favorite Looney Tunes characters back to the big screen. The movie wrapped last year. It was set to release. And now Warner Brothers says, ah, we're going to shelve it. Not just shelve it, actually. We're going to use it as a tax write-off and go, oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll write this down against our losses. This angered a lot of people in the film community, including my next guest, Toronto's own Eric Bauza, the voice of Wiley e. Coyote in the movie. He's in L.A. He's going to take us through this emotional roller coaster of working on a movie that you're excited about. And then the boardroom goes, I don't know. This seems like a good tax write-off. Eric, what's good, man? How are you, sir? Thank you for having me on. It's been a minute, uh, almost almost about a year till till like the the date that last year uh, you were on my CBC Gem show. Stay tuned. That was like almost the premiere. It was Dude. around this time last year. So thank you uh, for. Uh, on our on our work relationship anniversary, I know we 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 keep returning to each other, Eric, and I love that for us. And also, the last time that we saw each other, you uh, regaled me with many a uh, uh, Bugs Bunny voices. I don't know if you want to do it. You want to do it right, oh, right uh, at the top? That's right, dog. It might be a little too oily in the morning for me, but it's never too early for Daffy Duck screaming <laughs> in your face. Listen, uh, but yeah, this works. Uh, this works all the time. By the way, and what a what a party trick. Okay, I want to talk about the movie. I want to talk about the movie about the controversy. I want to talk about the movie itself. What is Coyote versus Acme all about? What makes it different, do you think, than other typical Looney Tunes shows? Well, uh, Coyote versus Acme was a film that was based off of a short story, uh, kind of a bit of a, uh, a a comedy piece that was written in the New Yorker. Mm. Um, that was uh, a story that follows our well-known coyote, Wiley Coyote, suing the Acme Corporation for years of not being able to catch the Roadrunner due to faulty products. So <laughs> we, we literally have an underdog going against the big uh, corporation uh, for, for uh, failed use uh, of, of products that, that have always backfired in Coyote's face. So um, I guess uh, Dave Green, the director, and uh, James Gunn, who was actually at that time, I don't think he was still, you know, he was working with WB, obviously. James for, Gunn uh, used to used to be the director of the big Marvel movies, Guardians of the Galaxy, and then he moved over to the WB to take over DC Comics movies. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. I think it was still even before he was kind of uh, handed that responsibility of uh, being like the CEO, you know, decision making at the DC uh, Extended Universe for yeah. films. So he was just, you know... Uh, obviously renowned uh, director, writer, producer at that time, but uh, they had teamed up uh, to create this feature now feature length film. Sure, uh, less less of a, a, a reboot and more of just an original story, like taking um, the story sort of further, right? Like figuring out, hey, her, yes. here's how we can progress the story. Doesn't sound like there's anything that is particularly controversial about this particular movie, you know, in terms of um, having it out there in the world, you know. And it also wasn't like. A, a a film based off of nostalgia. It was kind of just like here's an original story yeah. with the Looney Tunes characters. Let's go. Okay, so and, you you voice Wiley e. Coyote, and then how did you find how did you find that this movie is not going to be released? Well, well, here's the thing. So I, I start working on the film, just doing scratch dialogue at the very beginning, voicing pretty much like whichever characters. Because in the movie, traditionally, Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner don't talk. Right. They, they they are they are like exactly how they are in the short silent characters. Uh, we work on this film for a couple of years. Um, we, we're testing the film. I went to most of the test screenings, which uh, if if you're reading the headlines, all of it's true. It was testing extremely well, mm. uh, above average scores among family uh, audiences uh, that went to go see it. And uh, you know, I think one of the only bumps in the road that we got was for. For the a little film called the Barbie movie that happened last year, uh, and look, hey, that 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 decision to uh, switch us out for Barbie obviously worked well for Warner Brothers. Sure, uh, and uh, you know it, it's the end of the year almost, and I was literally uh, talking with Dave Green, the director, about hey, any ideas on like what we, like, you know this movie has to be coming out soon? It's been done. 
Uh, it's in the can. It's complete. Yeah. Like, how do you want to market it? And we're like coming up with these fun ideas. And literally within uh, the same week that the actor strike ended, it was kind of like that last, uh, hey, before you go. Just a, <laughs> like, just a that, big that old kick. But yeah, that surprise, uh, you know, headline. And again, if you're at home keeping score, this is now, I think, in the last two years, the third film that uh, Warner Brothers Discovery has decided to publicly announced that they're writing off a movie I- I- for tax purposes. That's they wrote one, off Batgirl movie. They Batgirl. wrote off a Scooby-Doo movie. Another another movie that was pretty much done in, in the can. I think uh, the director, Tony Servone, was, was pretty much just finished, completed the score uh, when he kind of found out the news. And this could have been literally the straw that had uh, broke the coyote's back. It was, <laughs> it was like strike number three. Sure. And it was it, it really caused a a wave among the fans. And I, again, I'm going to go to the fans first because I'm all, I, I'm a Looney Tunes fan first myself before I I, I count myself as a, a Looney Tune like part of the family because you know a lot of these characters these are the Warner Brothers flagship characters that are yeah. attached to that Warner Brothers shield that we see at the beginning of every movie. They they hold a lot of. Um, you know, ground and a lot of uh, core memories for a lot of our fans. And, right. and people are proud Looney Tunes fans. You know, you, you kind of grow up on either the Warner <laughs> Brothers side of the fence or the Disney side of the fence, Doc. And I happen to be on the Warner Brothers side. So even regardless of, of, of all of this, you know, I, I, I think for me, uh, you know, I, I find out where we're, the wind has been taken out of our sails. Sure. The entire weekend passes, but then Monday rolls around. And we get the new headline, like literally I, I must have been, I get like, uh, you know, uh, X formerly known as Twitter alerts and stuff. Uh, yeah. And I saw my phone light up at around like 545, almost six in the morning saying that they've reversed the action of tax write off. And now they're shopping they're allowing, it around. They're allowing the filmmakers to shop it around, yeah. which again, to me, hey, hey, thank you. Thank you, by the way. Thank you for doing that. I don't know how you could do that, but like what, what kind of. Uh, work goes into reversing the the tax write off process, but it still kind of again shows like, hey, w- w- maybe they're still not in a position financially where they can, you know, shop around their own characters. But right. They, I, I kind but, of think about like, what if Disney were to make like a Mickey Mouse movie and try to sell it to like Universal or DreamWorks? It just wouldn't – exactly. It wouldn't make – you don't think of it as something that makes a lot of sense. I should say like the social media reaction to this story has been huge. You have a lot of people, a lot of very famous people who say, I've seen the movie. I was invited to a test screening. I loved it. I don't really understand why they would want to do this. Uh, we got maybe about a minute left here. Earlier this week, you attended a screening for Coyote yep. versus Acme. You called it the intended farewell to the movie. What was the atmosphere in the room like for that? It was thick. The The air was thick in that room. Oof. Like It was a small group of people. It sure. was supposed to be the, the farewell funeral screening, but it turned out to be one of the most enlightening and celebratory experiences of this film. And it, Everything that was going on in the last four days up until that screening only helped make the movie that much better because art had now been imitating life, imitating art. Like it, <laughs> it was crazy. It was a crazy experience. And I'm again in my time with these characters in in my career, o- almost 20 years now in animation. I'd never been in a situation like this or experienced something as sure. amazing as um, I have been watching with great interest all the ways that people have been talking about the story. I appreciate you being here to sh- shed some light on the, your side of things, which is how it feels to be in it. Eric Bowser, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. Thank you. And, and on that note, I will say, yeah, the, 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 uh, that's not all, folks. <laughs> Never gets old, I'm telling you. Eric Bowser is a voice actor from Toronto. He's the voice of Wiley e. Coyote in the film Coyote vs. Acme. The movie was shelved last week by Warner Brothers Discovery. May yet see the light of day? I don't know. We'll keep you posted. That is it for the podcast today. Remember, you can listen to any episode of Commotion anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. If you are so inclined, you can also find us on YouTube. And if you have like two minutes today, I would really appreciate this. Just do me a little favor. Go to Instagram, follow us. We are at Commotion CBC. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. Hey, I'm going to be here tomorrow. If you're going to be here tomorrow, I would love to see you then. 